Hey everyone, Dr. Jay Gordy here, and today I'm going to be taking you through the discovery of the cellular basis of communicable disease. How did we discover that it was cells causing diseases that we could transmit between each other? All the plagues of Europe and um, Asia and Africa, how were these plagues turned out to be caused by cells, and how did we discover that? Now, a little diagram we got here, this was drawn by Louis Pasteur. Now, uh, we're going to be delving into him soon. He's definitely a badass. Um, and he basically showed that the reason why his beer was going off was because of the growth of these little organisms inside his beer. Now, these larger organisms here, these large circles here, is yeast. And that's supposed to be there. It's beer. It should contain yeast. But these smaller, long chains are not yeast, they're bacteria, and Louis Pasteur established that it was these bacteria that was ruining his beer. But let's jump further back in time, that's just a little side note, let's jump further back in time and just give a quick primer of the history of disease in human civilization. So if we look in um, ancient China, in ancient Greece, in ancient Egypt, ancient anywhere, um, the causes of disease were largely attributed to mysterious forces. Um, here we have uh, Athena shooting an arrow, and this invisible arrow would strike down humans with disease. Here we have a doctor treating uh, an Egyptian person, and behind is a god patting that doctor on the shoulder. And that's because when we looked at Egyptian medicine, there were descriptions of prayers that were given with the medicine and so it was very intertwined the idea of spiritual causes of disease and gods for protection from these diseases um and in china many um uh diseases were attributed to curses in ancient china to curses from the enemies or or from people you have wronged will curse you and strike you down with a disease and this was this was our understanding of disease and you know everywhere you could look at any culture throughout the world and curses were seen and spiritual causes were seen as one of the major causes of disease because how else were we to make sense of the world people would just drop dead what happened we didn't know we didn't have the technology or the understanding to know then along came this guy now there are multiple ways to pronounce his name i'm going to pronounce it hippocrates now hippocrates is considered the father of medicine he started to write textbooks about medicine and he did amazing things he was an ancient greek guy he lived around 400 um, before current era bce um, and he started a number of things he started medical ethics and many american doctors still take the hippocratic oath and in that hippocratic oath is first do no harm as a doctor um, he wrote books on medicine that were used extensively for nearly 2000 years so we're talking a long time people used um, Hippocrates foundation of medicine but um, one of his main hypotheses was that the humor theory of disease and this is the idea that um, the human body is full of liquids including red liquids which is blood yellow liquids which is bile black liquid which is also bile uh, and green liquid which is pus um, yeah so we are full of these fluids and it's an imbalance in on, in these fluids that cause disease and it kind of makes sense right like think about um vomiting right is that an excess of bile right uh think about pus coming out of a wound that's another disease and suddenly we've got pus spewing out of it seems like we've got an excess of pus think about spraining your ankle suddenly it swells up and becomes red it seems like an excess of blood so it made a lot of sense obviously there's no truth to it but one key thing was is he was saying physical things cause disease not mystical things and this is where this became the foundation of modern medicine um and so uh one example was to relieve one treatment based on hippocrates was to relieve people of these excess fluids so here is an ancient greek pot and here we have a patient and this doctor here has a scalpel and he is going to cut that person to drain blood because clearly the disease such as fever is caused by an excess of blood so we need to drain your blood now this practice 400 bce continued it even spread to ancient china it continued 
for millennia. Here we have, you know, just a couple of hundred years ago, uh, another example of bloodletting. He's cutting his arm and blood is draining out into this bowl. In fact, this is one of my favorite facts. George Washington, the first president of America, got a disease, probably a flu, and was visited as a wealthy person. He could afford it. Uh, he hired the best three doctors um, he could afford. Um, and they each came and they drained him of a pint to a pint and a half of blood. Now, if you get drained of somewhere between three and five pints of your blood, you are going to be in an incredibly bad state. But not only that, he had excess blood, but he may have also had excess bile. So they gave him mercury tablets. Mercury, the neurotoxin, the heavy metal, the really poisonous thing. They gave him mercury tablets to induce vomiting. And it it's hard to know, but it is quite likely that it was the treatment that killed George Washington. So uh, Hippocrates wrote, first do no harm. They clearly threw that out the window. Uh, but he also wrote, humans in balance. You know, over about 2,000 years ago before George Washington's death, he wrote, um, uh, the humors in balance is what causes disease. And writing that down over 2,000 years ago probably killed George Washington, which is such an interesting uh, pipeline. Um, but uh, Hippocrates' ideas were built on by uh, different authors uh, through, throughout those uh, 2,000 years. So Roman authors, Galen, he, he changed a lot. Arab authors, which um, often overlooked, um, essentially wrote the textbooks that spread throughout Europe on, on medicine. And of course, then uh, later on, European authors changed it um, and modified it. And one of the main ways they modified uh, Hippocrates' ideas was miasma. They came up with this idea of miasma. Um, and Galen, the Roman, was very uh, uh, for this. And miasma is the idea that bad gases and smells cause disease. Kind of makes sense a little bit. You've got raw sewage, you've got rotting meat diseases are likely to spring up. So it's the idea that bad gases and bad smells cause disease. Um, and two really good examples of this was malaria and cholera were believed to be caused by bad gases. Now malaria is spread by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes breed in still dirty water. So that kind of makes sense that you would see bad gases, your bad smells along with puddles of water, um, which breed mosquitoes which cause malaria and cholera is spread by a mixture by typically mixing sewage and drinking water and sewage smells bad so you can see where they got this association from even though it's wrong um, and in fact malaria literally means bad air mal means bad like malicious um, mal means bad or malpractice um, mal means bad and area means air in italian and so malaria literally means bad air this is how convinced they were of the miasma theory and the miasma theory was prevalent right up until the 19th century um all throughout the western world and it's where the big battle went down the big showdown and it was miasma theory versus germ theory the cellular basis of disease so this is the microbe theory of disease or germ theory and it really started with the optimization of the microscope the microscope had been around for quite a wee while um, but a guy called Luverhook um, optimized um, one, one version of the microscope and he could see up to 300 fold magnification um, and he started to use this magnification to look in things he famously looked in a in a in a pond near his town and he couldn't believe what he saw all these tiny animals here um, that he's drawn up here here we can clearly see some bacteria but there's also um, larger single-celled organisms and multi-celled organisms living everywhere they couldn't believe it water looks clear it looks like there's nothing in there but you take a sample of water and you look closely you see it so the, the, the germ theory really grew from this technological advance of the microscope. The microbes were first absor uh, observed and they were called animacules, which I just love and I wish we kept calling them anim animacules. That is a fantastic name. Um, and this is, a, I just have to mention this, this is a bit of a side note. This is one of the most patriarchal things I've ever seen. So they look down the microscope at sperm. Now, typical mean the thing, I've developed a microscope, I had to look at sperm. They looked at sperm and then they drew diagrams based on what they observed and they claimed to have seen uh, a an entire small human in the head of sperm. 
Why? Because of course women don't contribute to the baby. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> um, sexism is rife throughout uh, history and still rife today. And this is one of the most major examples of it. Women obviously don't contribute. They're just an oven and the sperm, is, the man is implanting the baby to be looked after by the woman. Uh, but when the child comes out, it's all the man. You can, yeah, it's 100% the man because there's an entire baby in the head of a sperm. Anyway, this is a great example of how biases can affect how we view science. And so it's why we must do things to avoid our biases seeping into science, such as blinding, which you might have learned about previously in, in experiments. Anyway, little side note. So anyway, uh, Louis Pasteur, famous French scientist, comes on the scene um, and he's got these fantastic microscopes to work with. So what does he do? And, he, and we now know about animalcules. Um, and we consider this guy the father of germ theory or microbiology. Um, so using, he did so many things, but I'm just going to touch on a, a few things. So using a microscope, he saw that the number of microbes increased as food rotted or as beer went off or as milk went off. So the rotting of food, the, when things get rancid, when things uh, go off, it's caused by the growth of microbes. Um, and he showed that he could prevent this with heat. So heating it up kills the bacteria or stuns the bacteria, and then the milk or the beer or the wine wouldn't go off in this if, if it was a sealed container. So if you had a sealed container, you heat it up, it's full of milk, it now won't go off. Um, and this is called pasteurization, and we do this today. Now, there have been multiple studies, there are no health benefits to unpasteurized milk. It's very risky to drink unpasteurized milk, which is why it's typically not allowed. Pasteurization, it's just a it's a three second zap of the milk to 60 degrees. That's all it is, and it stuns the bacteria and prevents their growth, and it makes it so much safer to drink. Or you could use chemicals. So we use chemicals to sterilize the outside of grapes and showed that those grapes now didn't produce wine. And it was because yeast on the surface of the grape was causing wine. And um, it also showed that you could use chemicals to kill off the bacteria and then things won't go off. So he was a real badass and he was the, he was the founder of microbiology and germ theory i think he, he's the kind of guy there were many people talking about it but he was the father of it he drove it home and really helped germ theory surpass miasma theory bad guesses now um what i want to talk about is this sign here there was surgeries um in the 19th century and before were pretty much a death sentence so much so that in a hospital in Scotland, the sign, prepare to meet thy guard, was nailed above the door of the operation theatre. So as you get wheeled in for surgery to happen, you can read the sign that says, prepare to meet thy guard. But then a Scottish uh, surgeon, uh, Joseph Lister, came on the scene. Now, Joseph Lister, uh, he came on the scene and pus and infection were considered an inevitable result of surgery. And many if not most if not nearly all people die following surgery from infections because they didn't do any cleaning or anything they use the same tools between patients um so we're talking about uh, a near death sentence going into the surgical suite it was a last resort um and they believed the pus was inevitable because the internal environment of the cell of the body is being exposed to miasma, bad gases, um, and, and without the protection of the skin. It would seem to be a, a normal reaction of your internal environment to the air, which is amazing. Um, and Lister, but Lister was reading about Pasteur's work, and he thought, you know what? Rotting meat, rotting milk, smells a lot like the wounds, the infected wounds that happen post-surgery. So perhaps it's these microbes, these germs, that are causing both the rotting of meat and milk and beer that Pasteur saw and the rotting of the meat in following surgery, the, the, the pussy, disgusting, infected nature of the surgery. Um, and he read about how Pasteur was using chemicals so uh, to sterilize um the uh, milk to prevent it from going off so he wondered was there a chemical that he could use for surgical tools and he stumbled across this one carbolic acid um, it does cause wild burns to skins but it also kills bacteria 
really well. Um, and so he started using carbolic acid. He would mist it, he would spray it in a mist over the surgical area while he was performing the surgery. And he would also wipe down all his tools and his hands, washing his hands. Can you believe they didn't used to do that? They didn't wash their hands, but they would wash their hands with carbolic acid. Um, and he performed surgeries and for the first time in history, there was no pus. There was no infection following these surgeries. Now, there was another surgeon in Scotland called Ogston, Ogston, and his students wrote this poem about it. The spray, the spray, the antiseptic spray, Ogston would shower it morning, night, and day for every sort of scratch where others would attach a sticky plaster patch he gave the spray. And here we can see the uh, carbolic acid spray going over the surgical area using Lister's techniques, right? And this is Ogston. Um, and this is brilliant. And so after Ogston uh, was reading about Lister and he performed the carbolic acid sprayed surgeries that were now sort of aseptic, they were sort of sterile, they didn't have this bacterial problems. He had several surgeries go by without any infection and he couldn't believe it. He thought pus was inevitable, but it wasn't. And he just loved the spray. In fact, he loved it so much, he went to the operating theater and yanked the sign off the door. He said, we don't need to tell them to prepare to meet thy God because we can now do Lister, Joseph Lister style surgeries. Such an amazing story. Um, and so Lister is really responsible for saving so many people's lives. Through Pasteur, you know, it's a massive team effort. But there's another person, and this is an interesting point about ideology and taking extreme views. Florence Nightingale, she is possibly my favorite person I'm going to talk about in all of this video series. She is the mother of nursing. She invented nursing. And she was on the scene during this battle between miasma and germ theory. Now, miasma people were saying bad air causes disease. So there is no need to clean your hands or surgical tools. Um, we just need to deal with the smells, such as the open sewer outside the hospital. Okay, so that was miasma theory. Now, germ theory, which was correct, went a little bit too far. You know, they said we don't need to address the causes of bad smell because there's germs on your hands and surgical tools that cause disease. The idea of airborne germs wasn't really prevalent at the time. So the open sewage is fine. <laughs> but Florence Nightingale was like, okay, look, I don't care. I think probably miasma is right. I don't care, is what Fl Florence Nightingale says. Can we just clean everything, right? So she was all about hygiene, all about cleaning everything. Not only that, she was also about, can we also care for these patients? And so um, doctors were famously apathetic about their patients, whereas Florence Nightingale, she was called the lady with the lamp, and she would visit them um, during the night with the lamp to make sure that they were okay. And she would look after them, you know, the um, deal with their bedpans and feed them, and she felt that you need to care for the patient as well as clean everything. Now, it gets even better. It gets, now, if that's not awesome enough, it gets even better, right? So Florence Nightingale, wherever she went, the death rate of the hospital plummeted. But people kept saying it was a coincidence. Before you came, we were going through a bad, a bad period. There was an outbreak. And then after you came, it was already subsiding. It has nothing to do with you. And this infuriated Florence Nightingale because whenever she went from hospital to hospital, she cleaned it up. She got rid of the open sewers. She cleaned everything down. She took care of the patients. She revolutionized um, how people cared for patients. Um, and so she became a statistical badass. She even invented a new form of graph called a rose graph um, to show that whenever she went to a new hospital, immediately after she turned up, the death rate started to plummet and uh, people surviving started to improve, which was amazing. Um, and that's because she, she was living in a patriarchal world, much more like, you know, we're still in a patriarchal world, but much more patriarchal back then. And so she had to fight up and use data to express her opinion because nobody would take her on her word because she was a woman. It gets even better. Now, I know you think, wow, she was a statistical genius. She invented nursing. Um, she was totally right about let's just clean everything. I put sewers are a bad idea. Um, uh, it gets even better. She was from an incredibly wealthy family. She did not need to go to the cesspits that were the hospitals of the 19th century, right? 
she could have lived her life like a Kardashian, being served, um, being a lady. She could have been married off very wealthy and just lived a life of leisure, but she wanted to help people. So Florence Nightingale is officially my favorite person of everyone I'm going to talk about in this course. Florence Nightingale, the mother of nursing and just a total, absolute awesome human being. Okay, so up next, I'm going to take you through um, a, a technique, the agar plate and the Koch postulates. I'm also going to go over that pronunciation too. 